Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Today we're looking at a data set of uh, tweets about airlines um, in the US. And we're going to try to take uh, the contents of the tweet. Let me get all the columns here so we can see. Uh, so here's the contents of the tweet. We're going to try to take the contents of the tweet and predict the sentiment of the tweet. So is it a positive, negative, or neutral uh, sentiment within a given tweet? And so I have a notebook here, um, given tweets about airline experiences. Let's try to classify the sentiment of a given tweet. We'll, we will use a TensorFlow artificial neural network with the GRU to make our predictions. So I have some imports here, uh, NumPy and Pandas, of course. And we have for, for pre-processing, we have quite a few uh, regular expressions. Emoji, which is a, a module that allows us to um, encode emojis as words which will allow us uh, to harness the meaning of the emoji in a tweet and uh, embed it in uh, vector space. Well, that will really happen with TensorFlow, but we also have the uh, natural language toolkit.stem, gives us the porter stemmer for stemming words, uh, tokenizer from keras.preprocessing.txt, and pad sequences from keras.preprocessing.sequence. These are both for encoding the uh, words. And then we will have train test split function just to get a train and test set. All right, so I'll go ahead and import those. And we'll start by loading in our data using pandas.readcsv, uh, read underscore CSV. And we'll grab the file path right over here in tweets.csv. All right, let's take a look. Now, like I said, we're only going to be using the text column for this task. And we also need the sentiment. Now, before I continue, I noticed that uh, we have this column, airline sentiment confidence. And this is the confidence of, um, basically, how, how confident are we that this sentiment truly matches the tweet? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to filter them. I'm going to say, OK, if we, if we have a sentiment uh, confidence less than 60%, so if we're less than 60% confident, that a uh, sentiment correctly matches the tweet, we're not going to use that that uh, tweet because it's bad data. You can think of as low quality data. So what I'm going to do is query the data set. Um, yeah, and we're going to say we're going to query it for all the cases where uh, airline sentiment confidence is less than 0.6. And why don't I just create uh, confidence? threshold v.6 and I'll just put that in here we can use an at sign to reference uh, environment variables and we're gonna see what we get okay so these are all of the rows where we have a low confidence under 60 percent confidence and it's only 238 uh, out of the original 14,000 so I think we can just go ahead and drop them so what I'm gonna do is get the index of them that will just give me the indices. And I can do data.drop those indices uh, on axis 0. And anytime we're dropping rows, we want to reset the index afterwards and include drop equals true to avoid using the new, uh, the old indices as a new column. All right, so um, once we've, we've uh, queried that for low confidence uh, tweets, we also want to just take the text column and the sentiment column and concatenate them together to create a new data frame. So I'm going to call it tweets df, tweets data frame. And it's going to be a concatenation of data sub text and data sub airline sentiment. And I'm concatenating them side by side, so axis one. And if we just want to look at what that looks like afterwards, you can see we now have the same number of rows. Uh, I mean, uh, after the uh, 200 or so have been dropped, so we have 14,402 rows and just the two columns, the text and the sentiment. So now we can use this as uh, to construct features. So what I'm going to do first, uh, I just want to make sure. Uh, OK, how do I put pre-processing up here? 
I want to check for null values. So uh, on tweetsdf, uh, tweetsdf dot is an a dot sum, uh, no null values at all. So not a single null value in the entire uh, data, data set, so we're good to go. Don't have to worry about that. Next, I want to know what is the distribution of the classes. So tweets df dot value counts, actually uh, sub airline sentiment dot value counts. And you can see we have far more negative reviews than, or negative sentiments than uh, neutral or positive. So this may affect our model's performance. Um, we may consider various, we, like we could use class weights to balance the data, but well, we'll see how it goes. Just good to keep this in mind. And then we're going to, uh, let's actually encode these as uh, numbers. So we'll create a sentiment ordering. This will just be the values in sentiment, but in the, uh, the order that we want. So let's make negative zero, neutral will be one, and positive will be two. So I just have to put them in uh, in that order. All right, and then all we have to do is tweets df dot apply. Actually, we're gonna apply just to this airline sentiment column. Dot apply, a lambda function that's gonna take in some x, which will be a given sentiment uh, prediction. And it's gonna output the that prediction uh, indexed in the ordering we specified. So it'll send anything that's negative will go to zero, anything that's neutral will go to one, anything that's positive will go to two, because we're taking the index of this list. All right, and there we go. So I'm just gonna assign that to the column. Okay. And I guess we can take another look at it. Uh, you can see we now have to deal with the text. And so we're gonna have a sort of a beefy function that's going to process this text. Uh, we're going to call it process tweet. So I'm taking a tweet. All right, so I'm going to do a series of um, filtering techniques and sort of um, just techniques to simplify the tweet and to turn it into uh, something that is much easier for uh, much easier to encode is right now if we let's say we want to encode each unique word it would be a mess because we'd have um, all like any sort of for example if someone wrote didn't with an apostrophe and then someone else wrote didn't without an apostrophe those would be considered different words in addition and if someone didn't capitalize I that would become a different word than if they did uh, $30 the uh, the model will have no way of knowing the difference between $30 and $20. Uh, they'll think of them as completely different words. So, um, and also emojis. Uh, look, this emoji is, is put onto the end of a word. So it's clearly, uh, this would be considered one word as opposed to someone else saying delays without an emoji would be another word. So we have to do some things to get this in order. I'm gonna start, I'll call it new tweet is going to be just a lowercase version of the original tweet. And that's a good place to start. We'll make everything lowercase to begin. Oh, sorry, that should, just like that, tweet.lower. And then I'm gonna use regular expressions. So I imported a RE at the top, and we can use some regular expressions to target various aspects of the tweet and make it uh, nicer. So what I'm gonna do, because there are tweets, is I'm gonna have a regular expression that's going to remove any at signs. And not just the at sign, but uh, the user handle that is attached to it. So this whole thing is going just going to go. And um, you know we don't have to do that exactly, but the, the especially like for the airline, it sort of it might uh, have some pr predictive value. But the problem is there's all these other ones that um, are just going to get in the way. It's not giving it, it's sort of muddying the data because it's definitely not useful to, to know someone's username. So I'm just gonna remove any at signs, and so any, any Twitter handles, essentially. 
what I'm going to do is call regular expressions.substitute.sub and we're going to get an expression and something to replace it with and the string we're performing the replacement on. And uh, so we have to fill this in. Uh, and we have this uh, nice site here, regx101.com, which will allow us to, here, why don't I grab this? I'll just grab this for an example. We paste that in, and then we can put in regular expressions and see how it affects the string. So um, what I want is just to target these, right? So if I put an at sign, that will target the at signs. And I want it to be followed by uh, any words. So if we look over here, there's a bunch of things you can, uh, a bunch of uh, tokens you can use. And we see any word character is backslash uh, w, lowercase w. So if I do that, uh, you'll see it's, uh, it's an at sign followed by any word character. So white space is not considered a word character. Um, however, if I put the plus, it will do it any number of times until we no longer have a word character. And this should work for numbers as well. Numbers are count as word characters too. So this looks like a fine regular expression to use. So we'll just cop, uh, cut that out, put it in here. And now we're going to search for any of these instances, so anything like this, and replace it with nothing because we're just getting rid of it. All right, and then um, we're going to deal with hashtags. So I think the best way to deal with hashtags here is let's just remove the actual hashtag symbol and leave the word intact. So uh, let's say at the end we had a hashtag something. Usually it's like this, right? Okay, hashtag hello. Uh, if we want to just capture those, we can do hashtag followed by word characters any number of times. And that will also give us what we need. Um, so, uh, actually, sorry, that's not true. Like I said, we don't actually want the word. We want to keep the word in there. We want to just remove the hashtags. So we can just use hashtag. And we wouldn't actually need to use regular expressions for this. Uh, because we can just use like a string dot replace. Um, but, I mean, since we're already using regular expressions, we might as well. But there's absolutely no need to use it for this situation. Um, and so we're just replacing it with nothing. We're just removing any hashtags, keeping the words on there. All right, uh, then what we should do is deal with emojis. So how do I get this into word form? Well, luckily we have this module uh, library called emoji that I imported. And it basically, let me grab that right there. And we call emoji.demojize. Uh, this. And basically what it does is it just replaces emojis with uh, the corresponding word that signifies the emoji. And it's always uh, surrounded by colons. So that's very useful. What we can do is say, uh, all right, let's, whoop, let's copy that, paste it in. Um, instead of processing, a, a doing a regular expression on the new tweet, we're going to do emoji.demojize new tweet. So we're going to demojize it first, and then we're going to find anything uh, with this notation. And it's actually pretty simple. All we're going to do is replace a colon with a space. And what that will do is, is create, uh, basically separate this into a new word, right? Any emoji, uh, even if it was on the end of another word, it will just become space, OK hand space. Right, so that will effectively allow us to encode emojis as unique words. And then let's remove URLs. So um, you, by URLs, okay, let's say we had something like in here, http colon slash slash www.google.com. Let's say we want to just capture that, right? So we want to look for HTTP, uh, anything followed by HTTP, right? So um, if you look over here, there's some more tokens we can use, this one especially any non-whitespace character. 
Here we don't want word characters, and I'll show you why. If we do the word character thing again, uh, you'll see that it does not capture anything. And if I had something here, it would. But the reason is this is not a word character, and neither are the slashes. So we don't want word characters. We want non-white space characters. So capital S, and that will ca that will capture what we need. So we're just gonna go in, and um, here. Why don't I just paste it in along with some other things? No, I'll just paste it like this. Okay, I have some comments there to show you what it's doing. So this will remove URLs. All right, a few more things, and I'm just gonna paste them in because you get the idea at this point. Uh, we have we're going to change dollar amounts to dollar, so this is a dollar sign followed by non-white space characters, and we're going to make that just the word dollar. We're going to remove punctuation after all that is done, so anything that isn't a through z or zero through nine or white space, we're going to remove, uh, and then we're going to change number values to number, so any numbers that are left over, uh, like this. We're just going to call the word number. All right, and then when it's done, we're going to split it. New tweet is going to be new tweet dot split on spaces. So now we'll have a list. Now new tweet is no longer a string; it's now a list. List of words separated by what used to be spaces. And now uh, we're going to have to map some, uh, we're going to use maps to map a function onto these lists. So let's map a lambda function that takes in an x and it's going to return, here let me show you this. So we have uh, something called porter stemmer which we imported from the natural language toolkit and we're going to call our porter stemmer object ps and this is basically going to stem words. So if I show you what, what I mean, let me rerun that and we, we call ps.stem on uh, happening. It just goes to happen. Happened also goes to happen. Uh, smiling goes to smile. You see it stems the words. It knows the root form of the word and it sends all the uh, all words it finds to stem. So the reason we do this is to try to encode similar words uh, as the same word, uh, which will improve our model's performance. So we're going to map this lambda function that's just going to stem the, the word. We're going to take x and change it into the stemmed version. And we're going to call, we're going to map that to new tweet. And when we're done, we're going to turn it into a list. And that's going to be our new tweet. All right, and then we'll, we'll map one more function, which won't be stemming, but will actually be stripping. And the strip will just remove any uh, leading or trailing white space. Lastly, um, if the empty string is in new tweet, let's just remove the empty string. This is not helping us. Whoops. All right. And now we should be done. We'll return new tweet. And that should have uh, fully processed our uh, tweets. So let's just put some more comments here. This will be stemming the words and stripping white space from the words. All right. So um, we create this porter stemmer object. I'm putting it outside of the function definition because uh, I don't want to create a new object every time we call this. We're going to have to call it on every single one. Although we could put it in if we wanted to. All right, so let us do this. We're going to create something called tweets. And this is going to be a panda series that just takes the text column from our tweets df, which is this thing. And we're just going to apply the lambda function element-wise. Uh, Actually, not a lambda function. We're applying process tweet element wise. And then I'm going to create labels, which is going to be uh, just the airline sentiment column. 
but I'm just going to turn it into a NumPy array. All right. Now, if we want to look at tweets, and this will this will take us just a moment, uh, but I'll take a look at tweets when I'm done. And we're also going to all right, here it is. So you can see tweets has gone from this to this. And so obviously this is not an easy one to do. Oh, it looks like we still have the empty string in there. It's a bit weird. Not sure why that is. Uh, it should be okay. I'm not going to worry too much about it. Um, but basically, uh, with this, we're going to have to create some sequences. So right now, it's not in a state where we can feed it into the model. It has to be numerical data. So um, there's a few ways to do this. One and the one of the uh, older approaches is uh, to one-hot encode uh, the words. So what I mean is have every unique word as a column and if a word is present in uh, the you could think of it as the vocabulary then we'll have a one there and a zero otherwise so it wouldn't actually be one hot encoding but it would be a uh, it would be similar to one hot encoding and that would just have way too many features Mike look at this okay so why don't we get the size of the vocabulary uh, I'm just going to copy and paste this in, and I'll explain to you. We're going to create a vocabulary, which is an empty set, and then for each tweet, we're going to count up the words. Uh, not count them exactly. Uh, for each tweet, we're going to add any words that are not already in the vocabulary to the vocabulary. Uh, and then at the end, we'll have a uh, vocabulary will be all unique words, and we can get the length to know the length of our vocab. Now we also want the maximum length of a given tweet. So what I'm doing is iterating uh, through the tweets and if the length of a given tweet is larger than the max length, which I initialized to zero, we'll just create set the max length to be the length of that tweet. So at the end we'll have the vocab length and the max sequence length. And you can see uh, we have 11,000 unique words and the longest tweet is 90 words long. Now this is what I was saying. Uh, if we were to use one hot encoding or a similar format, uh, we would have 11,257 columns. And that's just, it's, it's too much. Like, why, there's better ways to do it. And so what we're going to do is use a dense encoding. And uh, what I mean by that is we're going to take each word, each unique word, each one of these 11,257 words, and send it to a to a vector in a high dimensional vector space. And what that will allow us to do is capture similarities between words. We actually use uh, weights, trained weights, to learn the similarities between words, adjusting their vector representations. But it also allows us to uh, significantly reduce the number of features we have to use as input, because now the the length of the the features um, is only the length of the dimension of the vector space that we choose to embed the words in. So what I mean is every vector is, let's say we use a 32 dimensional vector space to embed our words. Each vector, meaning each word representation, uh, has only 32 values to represent it. And that's a lot better than uh, 11,257. Uh, a vector of length 11,257. So uh, let's get uh, on with that. So what I'm going to do is create um, tokenizer, and this is a uh, this is uh, from Keras dot preprocessing dot text, uh, and we specify a number of words. This will be our vocab length. That will be the 11,257. And what we'll do is we'll fit it. The the method is fit on text to tweets. And so what it's going to do is it's going to go through tweets, find each unique word, count up uh, the frequencies of each word, 
and then uh, encode each word as a unique integer uh, ranked from most frequent to least frequent. So what I mean is the most frequent word in the whole uh, corpus of tweets here is going to be encoded as 1. The second most frequent word will be encoded as 2. The third most, infrequent, most frequent word will be encoded as 3, and so on. So um, once we fit it, we're just going to actually uh, transform the tweets into sequences. So what we'll call tokenizer.text to sequences using the fit that we have created. And we'll call it on tweets. And we'll call this one sequences. Okay. We can then get a word index, uh, which is just tokenizer.wordindex. And that's just going to show us the most frequent words. Um, and finally, we'll create our model inputs. And here I'm going to call pad sequences. Because we want to feed TensorFlow a uh, NumPy array of a fixed length, we don't want to feed a variable length uh, sequences, we can use pad sequences to put zeros um, on the end or beginning of shorter sequences so that all sequences have length of 90. Uh, we could also make it shorter than 90, in which case anything that's longer than, than the uh, any sequence that's longer than what we choose will be truncated down to our desired amount. But we want uh, full information retention, so we'll keep uh, 90 as our maximum sequence length. Um, so we're going to pad the sequences and set the maximum length to the max sequence length, which is 90. And I'm going to include this argument padding equals post. This will just put the, the zeros at the end of the sequence rather than at the beginning. All right, uh, so we're going to tokenize it. Now, if you want to see what that looks like, our sequences uh, looks like this, which is just, um, it basically took these words and converted them into numbers. And the numbers are given by the word index. You can see the most common word is two. This is troublesome. We have the white, the, the empty string in here. Uh, I'm not sure why that is. I'm pretty sure I tried to remove it, but oh well, I, we, I could figure that out later. Um, but for example, the most common word is two. That's why it was given one, right? So if we look up here, there's a one in the second tweet. And if we look up here, we can surely see in the second tweet we have two. So two has become one because uh, it's the most common word. All right, so um, sequences looks like this, but once I pad it, model inputs looks like this. You can see each one is of length 90 now, and at the end we have these zeros to fill in for uh, the lack of words. All right, so now let's let's just look at the shape of this. And yeah, we have 14,000 examples and 90 features. Uh, and each one is a tweet with word enc uh, words encoded. Now we can split our data. So xtrain xtest, ytrain ytest. Uh, it's going to we use train test split function from sklearn that takes in model inputs as our x and labels as our y. Remember labels is just the uh, airline sentiment column turned into a numpy array. And uh, let's include train size 70% and a random state of this can be anything, how about 22. Alright, we'll split it and now we will start training. So um, let's start with the embedding. All right, so I'm going to do uh, make an input layer, tf.keras.input. And the shape, of course, 
is the maximum sequence length, which is 90. You have to just type max sequence length. It's a vector of length, max sequence length. And then I'm going to create an embedding layer. And the reason uh, the embedding happens in the model is because the uh, locations of each word vector in the vector space uh, is actually learned because um, it finds a way to uh, learn the similarities between words by grouping them together in high dimensional vector space. So um, we're going to create an embedding layer from Keras. An embedding layer takes three, um, three arguments, an input dimension, which will be um, the length of the vocabulary. Is, uh, how many possible words are we looking at? And then an output dimension. And this is where we just define uh, the vector space that we want. So I'm up here I'm going to write this embedding dimension. Uh, I, from my experiments, 32 seems to be best for this task. So we're going to have 32 dimensional vector space that we're going to encode, embed the words in. So output dimension will be embedding dimension. And then we also specify an input length. And this is going to be the max sequence length, which makes sense. And we'll pass in the inputs. All right, so before we go any further, um, I'm going to explain what I'm going to do. Uh, after experimenting with a few different models, um, I found I tried using a GRU, and I tried using nothing but the word embeddings, and both of them were decent. Um, GRU performed slightly worse, but when I combined them together, I found the best results. And I looked at um, some other notebooks here, and most people are getting around 80, uh, like 75 to 80 percent accuracy. Uh, one person actually got 90. Where is it? Here. This, this person did a very interesting... Actually, that's not the one I looked at. I don't know if I can find it now. Well, in any case, so I saw someone do a very interesting um, technique where they augmented the data to make up for the class imbalance. So what I mean is they took these ones, the they took neutral and positive examples, and created augmented data to balance it out. Um, and I was going to, I, I tried it. But it was it, it was taking a few hours to um, to complete, so I, I just decided not to do that. But that's definitely an interesting thing to th consider. Also, um, if we are to use class weights here to deal with the imbalance, uh, it will degrade the performance of the model because it's actually giving higher losses uh, by specifying class weights. The overall performance of the model will go down, but the performance within the minor classes will actually go up. So it's really a trade-off of what you're interested in. Do you want an overall better model, or do you want a model that performs better in each class? So uh, for our, I guess we're just not going to use class weights, but we certainly could. All right, so uh, let me explain what I'm going to do here. I'm going to create, I'm going to sort of split the model down. We're going to have on one side just the word embeddings which is the output of this layer, flattened into uh, an array or a tensor, and then sent to the end, to the output. And on the other side, I'm going to feed the word embeddings into a GRU, and then send the output to a flatten, and then send that to the output. So I, we can actually plot the graph, but I'll call this uh, model A, which will be uh, just a flattened layer. And then model B, which will be GRU with a flattened layer. So model A is just going to be a flatten tf.keras.layers.flatten. So you can consider this uh, as taking the word embeddings and just using the word embedding data. Okay, and model B is going to create a GRU 
which will be uh, tf.keras.layers.gru. Number of units will be embedding dimension. And we'll pass an embedding. So I'm feeding this, in, this uh, output into two inputs. And then for this one, I'm going to flatten after. So I'll call that gru flatten. Keras.layers.flatten. And that's some passing in GRU. And then both A and B are fed into the output. So I'm going to create a concatenation layer called concat, which will be tf.keras.layers.concatenate, concatenate, flatten, and GRU flatten. So this will just stick them side by side. So we'll have one long uh, tensor vector, you could say. And then our output layer is going to be a dense layer with three activations, one for each class. And it will be a softmax activation to generate probability estimates. And we're passing in the concatenated uh, inputs. So uh, from that, we're going to construct our model using the inputs and outputs. And when it's done, I'm going to plot it using the keras.utils.plot model. Uh, I just misspelled concatenate. And you can see this is how I described. On, we have the GRU and a flatten layer. And the flatten layer alone, both taking inputs from embedding, and when we concatenate the results together and output it to probability estimates. So um, let's actually compile and train the model. And the reason I'm doing this is because I found it had uh, good results. So I'm using an atom optimizer and a sparse categorical cross entropy loss function. And for metrics, we'll use accuracy. So the batch size, oh, let's do 32. And I'm going to train for a large number of epochs because I'm going to use early stopping again. So we'll store the model's fit history in history. And we'll train on x train and y train. Give it a validation split of 20%. Uh, batch size and epochs as we specified. And we'll specify some callbacks. So I'm going to use the early stopping, which will just stop the training when it sees the, the validation loss is no longer decreasing. So val loss is what we're monitoring. And we'll give it a patience of three, which is saying after three epochs, we'll stop. And we'll restore the best weights, the weights from the best epoch once it's uh, stopped. And let's turn on verbose mode. And then I'm also going to use uh, the callback reduce learning rate on plateau. I found it, it helped the, uh, helped the model converge more easily. All right, so let's run that. And so it's going, it's right. So it's training the GRU and it's training these, uh, and it's just flattening the embeddings. And then it's taking the trained GRU as output, which is also flattened, catenating it with the word embeddings, which are flattened, and then feeding that into a dense layer that will give us our predictions. Uh, we have a problem. What is the issue? Early stopping condition on metric, val loss. What's the problem here? Let me try this just to see if I have something wrong. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I shouldn't have put this in, in, in a list. Just val loss. What happened? Huh? What's What does this mean? Oh, I. Give me one sec. All right, let's train that. 
and it shouldn't take too long. I think mine trained for about uh, eight, six, six or seven epochs. Um, it it starts to overfit very quickly, so that's why the early stopping comes in handy. Um, but you can see right away we have a validation accuracy close to what we're aiming for. Uh, if we can get over 80, we're in a good spot. Uh, although I'm pretty sure this is, you can take this up to 90 if you employ some uh, some more strategies. Let's like look at this one. Uh, the end. This is the models this person trained. Uh, got to 79.7 .7 on neural network, and everything else seemed to do a little worse. But in our case, let's see. Here I'll say uh, results model dot evaluate x test y test and we got over 80 so it's looking very good um, so I guess that sums up today's video uh, thank you so much for watching I hope you enjoyed it if you did make sure to subscribe and hit the uh, hit the bell for more content and leave any comments in the section below so uh, thanks again for watching I'll see you guys tomorrow have a fantastic day